being a family caregiver is one of the most important jobs you'll ever have and one of the most challenging. The role can be frustrating and satisfying, exhausting yet joyful, thankless but so rewarding. More than 675,000 residents in Louisiana consider themselves family caregivers, whether they're caring for a loved one or a family member. Some were thrust on the caregiving journey by a sudden event and others more gradually over time. Whatever the case, if you consider yourself a caregiver, I hope you know you're not alone. Today, I've asked Allison Lolly, a native of Monroe, Louisiana, to join me to share the caregiving story of her mother, Cheryl. Her mother is one of the uh, 2,200 nursing home residents that have lost their lives due to COVID-19. That's 2,200 older folks in nursing homes have lost their lives. Allison, it's so good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us and, and sharing your personal story. Uh, first, I am so sorry that you lost your mother under these tragic circumstances. I know you and your family are still grieving. Thank you. But I also know through our own conversations that we've had that you really believe sharing your caregiving story is important. And not only to inspire others to also share their story, but to also inspire change and in how we care for those who are most vulnerable to the coronavirus. So thank you. Thank you for your time today. Welcome. I know you're a mother, you're a sister, an aunt, a daughter. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I was in the newspaper industry, actually in Dallas, for a, right at 30 years. Um, and, and candidly, I grew up in a family with women and, and none of the women in my family really had careers. Um, they were stay home mothers or very committed to community service in the areas in which they lived. And I broke the mold a little bit and went out and got in the newspaper business. And after my father passed away in um, May of 2018, it was just a complete departure for me in terms of priorities. As you know, the newspaper industry is a tough place to be, but losing a parent um, and watching them pass just really changed things for me. So last 30 years, you know, pre-18, career, 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 and caregiving for my mother while raising girls and trying to be a wife and do all the things we tend to want to do. Um, but then after dad passed away, I reshifted all my priorities. I really focused my energy on how could I get to a place where I could have a well-balanced life and really commit myself to a second season? So my life is, has really been bookended with the first season being um, not as much enrichment. And the second portion has been uh, of amazing enrichment as I've lived through the transition of losing both of my parents in a period of 18 months. Mm. I, I, I like the, the, phrasing your first season and then your second season mm -hmm. uh, as what a gift to be able to um, have both of your parents alive um, and then to see them transition. You were with them. And I know 2018 marked that first transition. Mm -hmm. Then you really focused on caring for your mother, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. How long did you, you care for her? So my mother's circumstances are, um, somewhat unique in that when I was 18, she was diagnosed with a mental illness. Mm. So, you know, I'm in my mid fifties. Uh, so I was a caregiver for the majority of that time. At the time that mother was diagnosed, we didn't really accept and understand mental illness the way we do today. Uh, and my father really struggled with being able to find his place in that caregiving role. Uh, and I stepped in. Uh, it, it, I stepped in and pulled out of college and devoted myself in many, many ways to her care. Um, and I would say, you know, I spent, a, you know, from really 1983, 1984 until April the 29th of 2020 as her primary caregiver. Um, many of those first years were with her living independently and us really working to keep her independent. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, she, she really suffered more and we fought the nursing home environment. To, to us, to, to put mother in a nursing home, either one of our parents was a failure. 
And so we worked for years to avoid that. And, you know, it took a toll. It took a toll on her um, because she wanted independence and we wanted to give it to her. And it took a toll on both my brother and myself and our children because she lived with us so much during difficult times. Um, I would say over that time period, she probably lived in my home for five or six years. Um, you know, some the longest period was a little over a year, but it was a lot of in and out and in and out. So going into a nursing home environment was maybe the most difficult decision I've ever had to make in my life. And then how, so, but when, when did you know, when did you come to that point that you knew it was just too much and she when, needed when, when she was, a, when she was truly a harm to herself, it, it, to leave her in an unsupervised environment where mm -hmm. she had, where she had consistent medication and a routine that kept her at a baseline was critical. It was critical that, that we do that. And, then finding a place that could accommodate those needs because they're, I don't know what percentage of, of nursing home residents might have that issue versus dementia or Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But mother didn't go to a nursing home because she physically needed to be in a nursing home. By the time we got there, she was in a wheelchair, but primarily her health condition that led there was mental illness and <clears throat> self-care, the inability to self do, you know, provide her own care. Right. So th the activities of daily living, she needed mm -hmm. that. She did. Okay. And so, you know, I know we had talked previously, but how long has she, did she live in a nursing home? She went into the nursing home in Texas in 2012. And okay. she stayed in the same nursing facility the entire time. So okay. she was there from 2012 until December of 2019. Okay. And then y'all eventually moved her to Monroe. Is that right? So, yes. After my father passed away, I made the decision to move her back because we're all natives of Monroe to return her to Monroe. The nursing home where she was in Monroe was right around the corner from dad's. Like literally I could walk there in five minutes and it gave me the ability to say, I'm going to commit this time to really making mother my top priority. Because, I, you know, she was aging and, and her health was beginning to deteriorate. And it also gave me an opportunity, as you said in the opening, mm -hmm. to experience the enriching part of caring for her. So I got that. I, the 10 weeks she was with me in Monroe, I got that. Um, so, you know, backing up and you know, talking about how difficult the decision was, mm -hmm. I was stunned by the challenges in the nursing home environment. Uh, so you, you make the really tough decision and then you begin the process of discovering the inside of that business, you know, and, and it, it becomes extremely difficult to navigate and to properly care with consistency because the things we'd want to do at home, we can't necessarily provide there. Right. What was maybe one of the most surprising things to you? Uh, the turnover. And staffing at all levels, at all levels. It was it was a constant start over. It was a I mean, I would tell you that I think in in the Texas nursing home, there was probably in that period of time, four or five different administrators. And then nurses and social workers changed on an ongoing basis. And it's not just the facility where mother was. I've since learned that is that is the business model. And, and, and unless you're in a very high end private setting and for those folks that can afford that, it's different. But when you're in a setting <coughs> where oh, hi, Charlie, um, in a setting where, you know, <coughs> you're, you're you're at a in a you're having to do that. And some of the financial resources are not the same. Right. The, the services are different. So there's different levels of care. So when you got to Monroe, were you able to then kind of supplement that? I mean, continually visit her and supplement the care she received? Was I, that did. I did. I, I literally feel like she was just in another part of the house almost 
because she was so close to me that I could consistently do everything from starting with morning breakfast, um, having lunch with her, visiting in the afternoon, doing her laundry, scheduling friends to come and visit with her, taking her out with, for family visits. You know, she just had a lot of a, a tremendous quality of life when we were able to do that. The day-to-day -day responsibilities for mother, we hadn't been able to handle for two or three years, just based on the fact that she was wheelchair bound and had a lot of specific medication needs that were outside of the day-to-day -day care. So we weren't, we were no longer able to physically do it. That, that portion. Right. And so Allison, you have a brother. I do. Brother. You have, um, children of your own. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that most of that caregiving, the duties fell on you because you were close to her, closest to her? Or did you all kind of figure out a plan? Or how did you break up some we of those? Did. It, and you know, a, a lot of what you talked about, it is in our conversation previously, my brother and I had to div divide and conquer. And we had to also say, what, what do you feel in your heart? that you can do best to serve mother. And so Gregory took on the financial responsibility. And I said, I don't want her to ask me for money on an ongoing basis. I don't want that financial day-to-day -day responsibility. I want to care for her as a person. And so Gregory took on the financial portion and, and, and the limited business that there was to do. And I did the personal care. Um, my children, my three daughters were also active in that process. And my husband, Robert, at the time was also very engaged. So, and my mother's sisters were involved, even though they didn't live in the same state. So the primary role came to me. I was the point person on, on in the first call on everything. And, and she leaned on me heavily and we had role reversal for a long time. Right, long time. right. You, you became the mother that she was to you, I'm sure. Until those last 10 weeks. Yeah, yeah. So I think that is so important. Um, when you um, go on this Caribbean journey, I in fact um, lost my mother in 2009. And it's so important that just those lines of communication within your family, however big it is or small it is, um, and that just like you said, what is on your heart? What is the best thing that you contribute to your mother's care? And everybody found a role. Mm -hmm. And so often we just don't want to talk about it. You know, how easy was it for you guys to talk about? It was very difficult in the beginning. So think about it. We started this journey with mother when my brother and I were both very young and we were starting our families. And so for us, depending on where we were in child rearing, and depending what environment mother was in and what state of mind she was in, mm -hmm. we had to consistently flex and pivot until we really got in a groove and it became routine for us. And we got into, into a, a rhythm, but initially there was a lot of conflict and a lot of resentment, a lot of resentment, unmet expectations because we didn't communicate well and the system's very difficult to navigate. It's difficult to navigate. You don't know what you don't know and you have all these expectations and, and, and our loved ones are not loved ones of the people inside the nursing home. Mm -hmm. In so many cases, it's a job. There are wonderful people in the industry too, wonderful. But, but the quality of care and the guilt you feel that you're not, that we felt that we could not care for her in our own home was always the backdrop. If we had been able to care for mother in the home, the quality of all of our lives would have been radically different. True, so true. I've heard that from, um, from mm -hmm. so, so many families. Mm -hmm. And you're right, you, you don't know what you don't know until you're on the caregiving journey. And there's not a lot of folks that reach out to try to help you. You just, you figure it out one way or another. You, do. Uh, you know, what Medicare pays for, what they don't pay for, right? What Medicaid and, and private insurance, if you have it. Um, and it's a, a lot of families do figure it out and they get a routine. But at first it feels like you're really cobbling together 
to just try to make it, mm -hmm. uh, try to get the best care. So I want to I, I want to pivot to um, when did you when COVID nineteen hit, um, and I'm sure you saw just the devastation. Uh, it started up in Washington State at the one nursing home, and we knew early on that the pandemic was hitting the, the most vulnerable really, really hard in nursing homes. What were the feelings that you started to have when this when this started? You know, this is so, it sounds so naive, but we just didn't realize how vulnerable we all were. We didn't realize none of us were prepared for what was coming. And I don't know, I think I, for some reason, I believe that that nursing homes had to have had an emergency preparedness plan at least a communications plan. So I spent a lot of my time up front, you know, the administrator at the nursing home would tell you, I wore her out on what's the communication plan. How are you going to communicate? If you're going to lock us out because you're being told you have to, or you're making the decision, depending mm -hmm. on what, what was they were hearing on the trickle down and what decisions were being made at the state level, you know, how are you going to communicate? And there was no communication plan. And that, that caused us a tremendous amount of anxiety, tremendous. Um, and you lose complete confidence. I mean, in a for-profit business with no preparedness plan and you can't get inside, um, it was very, very, very stressful. So we increased our visits and we, she, we, she had just been moved to a window room. If she had not been, we wouldn't even been able to see her. No. And, um, she or not as easily. And so, every person that was either in our family circle or a close friend took turns, you know, the, the schedule would shift, but we were looking for inconsistencies. And then I, every day, you know, once we realized we got a letter in the mail that COVID was in the building and we were told, you know, to call in and get the information. And once we called in, I established with the administrator what, our family's expectation was going to be in terms of being comfortable. And if another case came out after the first one that we were going to consider moving her out. So we just immediately took control of communication. And so you, you initiated it, correct? I did. I did. And did you feel like you had to initiate it every time? I did. I did have to initiate it every time. And so in your visits with your, your mother through the window, um, which is all you had, talk to me about um, her health and kind of what you observed through the window. So mother had developed what appeared to be the beginnings of pneumonia before COVID even struck. So she'd been on oxygen for a period of time, but she didn't need to be on it on a regular basis. And her coloring had been good. And we were not checking in with them at all on medical medical day-to-day -day changes before COVID. So while we knew she was having a little bout, we didn't expect that it was as serious as it was, right? And we certainly didn't know what the compounding effects of COVID might look like. So from the time that we started window visits that I think were around like March the 14th, and remember she passed on April 29th, I would tell you the first few days, I was so focused on making her feel okay about seeing me stand outside the window with a mask on. The minute I would come to the window, she would scoot over in her wheelchair and she was just so happy to see me mm -hmm. that we just were beginning to figure out, okay, we've been seeing each other every day now for the first time in years with the kind of rhythm that we had. We'd never been afforded that because I had actually moved to a different house that, you know, wasn't as close and I couldn't have as frequent a visit. Come, Charlie. Come, come. Come, come. Um, and so the first part of it was just getting used to the new visiting routine. But I mean, within three or four days, we began to see deterioration. And it started with just a lack of, of bathing. And she wasn't getting a bath because they didn't want to put each of the residents into the general population. They did not have a plan for that yet. Okay. And then it was... She, her normal staff wasn't showing up for work. And then it was new people were showing up for work and her very specific diet was not being met. And then we came to see her a couple of times and she wasn't clothed. So, you know, I've since learned 
I, and I can't prove it to be the case, but there were days where only a couple of individuals were showing up at the nursing home because of COVID. And so they didn't have the staff in place, but again, no communication no communication. So that's, you know, and, and I found that to be very, very consistent across the board. If you want communication within a nursing home, it's on you. If you want consistent routine communication and a care ah. plan, it's on you. So could, I'm curious to know, so through the window, could your mother hear you or did, was it open at all or? You know, literally I would put my face up to the screen on the window. We walked behind a set of bushes with an air conditioning unit that half the time was coming off and on and we'd get right up on the window. And then if we had any issue where it was just really too difficult, she'd pick up the phone. We'd call, okay. we'd go cell phone to phone, but not often. We, we tried really hard to get really close to one another at the window. And, you know, that's really the most difficult thing for me is just, you know, all those years of, she was in the best place ever. She was just in such a wonderful place and so happy to be home and to see her have to witness it. Just uh -huh. the, 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 the thought of the witnessing of the, the, the window visits and the number of times I came with a mask or she knew I was going to come and bring certain things and I wasn't allowed to bring those items into the nursing home. That, that was really the most difficult part was trying to explain to her in some in some cases, how I was doing. It was just as hard for me and she knew it. Mm -hmm. I bet she did. She did. And so um, things continually progressed mm -hmm. and um, as we know, got worse for your mother. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the, the day she passed. Well, I'll tell you about the day they called to tell me that she, her vitals had changed. So I think I got a phone call let's call it four days before the 29th. So between the 24th and the 26th and uh, the nurse and her nurse who had not been at work for a couple of weeks had come back to work. And the day she got back, she called me on the phone and said, your mother does not look right. Mm -hmm. And I knew when I got here, she didn't look right. And her vitals have changed. Um, and it wasn't shortly after that, that they made the decision to transfer her to the hospital. And, and I knew by that point, we knew about underlying conditions and, you know, I was watching her deteriorate and I just knew the likelihood that she had COVID was great. So we got her on the phone before she got in the ambulance and I called my brother and we, we really, that was our last time to truly have a lucid conversation with her um, and just tell her how much we loved her. And then she went to the emergency room at the hospital where they quickly notified me that many patients were coming out of the same facility on a regular basis. And they had already assumed she had COVID, even though she didn't have a diagnosis because none of the residents had been tested at the time. And they moved her up to the COVID unit later that afternoon. And I, I got to speak with her. She, they put her on an iPad for me. It was wonderful at the hospital, hmm. lots of communication. And um, they put her on an iPad for me and she looked straight up and it was as though she knew, you know, and, she said, she said, I love, 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 love you. And that was really the last time she was ever with her eyes open. And, um, you know, we made the decision not to put mama on a ventilator. It wouldn't have, she didn't really need it candidly. She went fairly peacefully. Um, you know, a lot of medicine, a lot of medicine for comfort. But, um, you know, we, I, I would, FaceTime with her three and four times a day. And then we would do Zoom calls with the family, the whole family. And um, several nights they would put the iPad in the room and I would sit in my room and sleep knowing that I, that she, she was there and I was there and I, it was comforting, you know, it was comforting. And um, the morning of the day that she died on the 29th, the whole family did a Zoom and we could feel her reacting to us, you know? And so we felt like she wasn't alone and she had wonderful, wonderful care in the hospital. Well, again, I, you know, express on behalf of all of AARP, our condolences, Thank um, you. you and your family. And Thank you. we have learned so much um, through this entire process through this pandemic and we're, we're still learning. 
Um, but but some of the things that uh, you know I've heard you share in your story is this the communication um, is incredibly important. And one piece of advice you would give to others is take that on yourself. You have to you own it. You've got to own it, right? You have to own it. And um, the other thing, you know, through all of this, Allison, I, I just wonder how how do you how did you care for yourself during this whole time, even even when your mom was um, not in a nursing home and you were still providing so much of her care? You know, I didn't do it well in the early years. I didn't do it well at all. I, I believed I was superwoman and I could manage all of it, right? And I did not realize what an underlying toll it was taking on me. And at one point, a, a friend made the suggestion that I go into a family to family class that would better equip me for self-care, much like when you're saving someone that's drowning or you're in an airplane, wow. learn some skills. And that really changed everything for me. And I think I probably did that in 2013 or 14. And that made a real big difference for me. I also learned to set healthy boundaries with mom. Because when you feel so guilty that you've had to place your mother in a nursing home environment due to circumstances, I, I carried a lot of guilt. And, and any time that she would express the desire to be out and be independent, which happens with so many families, I had to learn to set healthy boundaries that didn't leave me emotionally devastated. So I had to frame up some consistent responses that would work for both of us. You know, since, you know, and then after dad, the combination of dad passing and me being so excited about having time with mom to then lose her 10 weeks later, that was tragic. That was tragic for me. Um, I'd kind of, I painted a picture of how life was going to be and it all got washed off the canvas, right? But the stakes were so high for me emotionally based on not being able to be with her when she passed that I knew I had to take care of myself. So I've made a lot of changes, a lot of changes um, in terms of, of just truly making time for myself to keep myself healthy and whole. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, you know, prioritize people and activities. And I wish I had realized that in the early years of caregiving. I, I missed that. I missed that lesson early on. And, and with that comes resentments and, and you're exhausted and you don't have capacity for your commitments. And I just can't encourage people enough. When you have to make the decision, understand you've got this wonderful opportunity to have your loved one in a safe place. And if you participate and you have ongoing meetings and dialogue with the caregivers, you're, the odds are that you're going to have a pretty good experience if the nursing facility is in good standing with the state or, or whatever their oversight programs may be. Um, you know, I think the other thing that's really, really important to, to realize is, is if you can have your loved one be at home and if you can find a way to make that work, there are a lot of programs out there and a lot of services, depending on what state you're in, that will facilitate that until such time as you have to make that difficult decision. I'm on the board at, at VNA in Texas, which is Meals on Wheels, and they're also the oldest hospice provider in Texas. And when I see the beauty of individuals that are able to stay at home and maintain their independence, um, that quality of life is, is, is so important. And uh, so doing everything that you can to to keep your family at home and to rally the whole family to take a role, no matter how heavy or how light. Um, I wish we'd had that opportunity. Yes, that's so important. So important. Um, well, Allison, thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing your story, which I know um, is, is hard, is difficult, but it's yet so important for others to hear it so that they know they're they're not alone in their caregiving journey and um i also want to thank you on behalf of aarp for all of your work in these last couple of months um, to advocate for families with loved ones in nursing homes and i want to remind everybody that you can download your own prepare to care guide from aarp.org the website and you can go to aarp.org home slash family 
and then slash caregiving, you see it right there on your screen. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Mama's Girls. Thank you.